Hello everyone. I hope everyone is doing good and all is well. Today's chat is going to be about the brutal and destructive New York City Draft Massacre, aka Riot, that began on July the 13th, 1863. The massacre lasted nearly an entire week and it was the largest civil violent uprising in U.S. history aside from the Civil War. Now, what happened during the New York City Draft Massacre is still hard for many to believe, and the reason the massacre occurred altogether still puzzles and confused many people as well. And with that being said, let's chat. New York City. In 1860, New York was the home to over 800,000 citizens, and one out of every four was an Irish-born immigrant. New York City had the largest Irish community outside of Dublin by the time of the Civil War. And several of the Irish men, they worked as skilled laborers, but the majority, they worked as unskilled laborers on the docks, they worked the street pavers, ditch diggers, cart men, and coal heavers. And the Irishman's biggest competition when it came to landing jobs as unskilled laborers was African Americans. Now, African Americans, they had settled in New York long before the Irish. African Americans had been in New York since the Revolutionary War and their communities had actually begun to grow. And they established and sustained, sustained literary societies, free schools, newspapers, and churches. And for those who don't know, the Revolutionary War, also known as the American Revolution, or American War of Independence, was fought to secure America's independence from Great Britain. And the Revolutionary War began April the 19th, 1775. The war was followed by the Lee Resolution on July the 2nd, 1776, and the Declaration of Independence was adopted July the 4th, 1776. And the Revolutionary War, it drew to a close in 1783. But back to the story. Now, many African Americans and Irish people, they lived in mixed communities along the lower half of Manhattan close together, but the Irish community, they didn't like the com black community very much. And the black community, they didn't care much for them either. Now, when more and more immigrants migrated to New York around 1840, the jobs that normally went to the African American population went to the newly arrived immigrants because the immigrants were willing to accept lower wages. And sometimes when the African Americans would compete with the immigrants for jobs, especially the newly arrived Irish immigrants, the competitions turned violent or even deadly. And as the years passed, tensions rose between immigrants and the black population. And when the Civil War broke out in 1861, most of the white population within New York opposed the Union and they supported slavery. However, surprisingly, when Mayor Fernando Wood called for the city to break away from the Union and join the Confederacy, most New Yorkers did not really agree. Now remember, the Union, the Union was against slavery. And the Confederacy, they supported slavery and did not want it to end. So the fact the New Yorkers who were against the Union and supported slavery turned down the opportunity to actually join the Confederacy, it was quite shocking and surprising to many. Now, many would think the tensions of war would bring the citizens and neighbors of the town closer together, but no. It only caused a greater divide and greater competition between the blacks and Irish population. Jobs became scarce and unemployment rates rose more and more. And to make matters worse, the cost of living went up 
faster than the wages in 1862. And to make matters more tense, President Abraham Lincoln announced the Emancipation Proclamation in September of 1862 and confirmed the immigrant workers' worst fears. On September the 22nd, 1862, President Lincoln issued the Preliminary Emancipation Proclamation, which declared that as of January the 1st, 1863, all enslaved people in states currently engaged in rebellion against the Union shall be then and henceforward free forever. Now, what many do not know is that when Lincoln signed the formal Emancipation Proclamation in January of 1863, he did not free all 4 million slaves within the United States. He only freed the slaves within the Confederacy. And he did not free the slaves in the bordering states that remain loyal to the Union. Now, with tensions already high, Lincoln's decision for emancipation sparked protests and riots amongst the workers all throughout the city. Now, soldiers and officers, they also joined in on the protests, claiming that they participated because they signed up to preserve the Union, not to end slavery. Things had gotten so bad when the Erie Railroad Company hired black people to move bales of cotton during a strike. The striking crowd beat the black people until they left. Black and white workers were hired by the Hudson River Railroad, but only black, black workers were targeted for violence. One person stated, The defeated workers seethe with resentment against the replacement whose dark skin made them stand out conspicuously and rendered them easy targets for revenge. By the time of the Civil War and the Civil War draft in 1863, Many Irish people had a dislike and distrust for black people, and soon that dislike turned into hate. And that hate led to the very reason we're all here today. The New York Draft Riot, better known as Massacre. As I said earlier, the Civil War broke out in 1861 and it lasted until around 1865. Now, it was a war fought between the United States and 11 Southern states that succeeded or separated from the Union and formed the Confederate States of America. And the Union represented 23 free states that remained loyal to the U.S. Constitution and continued to be a part of the United States of America. And the Union represented a unitary country free of slavery. Now, the Confederacy, on the other hand, they supported slavery and did not want the government to have much power. So the 11 slave states, they separated from the United States of America when Lincoln was elected president. And the 11 states were called the Confederate States of America. And the Confederacy had its own government with President Jefferson Davis as its head man. And by 1863, there was a great shortage of manpower to fight within the Civil War. I mean, it had been two years since the war broke out. So willing new enlistees, they really did not exist. And as a result, Lincoln's government passed a strict new conscription law. Now, conscription law is a law that makes enlistment in a country's armed forces mandatory. Or in other words, are also known as the draft. Now, to many families, a draft could be devastating and the worst thing they could possibly imagine. And this was definitely the case when it comes to New York families in 1863. When Lincoln's government passed the new conscription laws, 
many families were devastated. Now, the reports differ when it comes to the conscription laws, you know, when it comes to the ages of the males. Now, some reports state that male citizens between the ages of 20 and 35, the single ones, an all unmarried man, also between the ages of 35 and 45, were all drafted into the military. Now, other reports state that it was men between 20 to 35 who were single and all unmarried men 20 to 45 that was drafted into the military. And other reports state that, and this is the one that I actually think may be a little bit more on point when it comes to the actual description of the conscription laws. It says other reports state all male citizens between the ages of 20 and 45 were drafted but they were drafted into two clauses. The first class, it includes single men between the ages of 20 and 45 and married men between the ages of 20 and 35. And the second class, it included men between the ages of 35 and 45 years old. And the second class would only be called in to fight if there was any reason for them to fight in the war after the first class had been exhausted. Now the reports differ when it comes to the men's ages, but they are all the same throughout when it comes to the fact that the men were drafted. However, there was one way out of the draft, and it's pretty much the same way out of many circumstances in today's time and something that many use to this very day money. One could buy themselves out of the draft if the price was right. An eligible man could enter a lottery and buy their way out of harm's way by hiring a substitute. Now a substitute could be hired by paying the government $300. And today's time this equates to about $5,800. Now, to many, $300 may not seem like much today for one's safety, but for New Yorkers in 1863, $300 was about a year's salary, which made avoiding the draft impossible unless you were a wealthy man. Now, if you were a black man, however, you were not considered a citizen, and you were exempt from the draft. And of course, the white men were furious at the fact the black men were not drafted into war as they were. Now, the white men, they were filled with anger and fear over the draft. So they lashed out with riots. And the riots, they didn't only occur in New York. The riots, they also occurred in Detroit and Boston as well. There were riots everywhere over the draft. And to make matters worse... The newspapers, they printed articles that only added fuel to the fire. On Saturday, July the 11th, 1863, the first draft lottery of the conscription law was held. In New York City, it remained calm and quiet for an entire 24 hours after the draft lottery. It was not until Monday, July the 13th, 1863, the horror and mayhem began. Early Monday morning, around 6 or 7 a.m., white workers, mainly Irish and Irish-American citizens, they began their attacks on government and military buildings. And they did this to symbolize that they felt the draft was unfair. The angry white mob, now they initially only attacked those who interfered with their destruction, such as policemen and soldiers. But by that afternoon, they turned their focus on black people and anything that symbolized black politics, economics, and black social power. The mob was armed with guns, clubs, and bats. And when they came up on the corner of Broadway and Chamber Street, they brutally attacked a black fruit vendor and a nine-year-old boy. 
and when the mob arrived between 43rd and 44th Street, they came upon a black orphanage that housed over 200 black children by the name of the Colored Orphan Asylum. Now, the mob viewed the orphanage as a symbol of white charity towards blacks. And the orphanage, it was fully stocked and financially stable with 233 innocent little lives inside, attending school, playing, or recovering from an illness. And when the mob came upon the children and the orphanage, they took as much of the children's bedding, clothing, food, and other transportable items as they could. And they set fire to the building. And firefighters, they did all they could, but they were unable to save the building. And the destruction of the building, it only took about 20 minutes. Now, thankfully, the mob spared the lives of the children. And surprisingly, some of the white men within the mob spoke up for the children and spoke against the mob for not helping them. And of course, the men were punished by the mob for seeming overly sympathetic to blacks. Now the children, they were kept at the police station for three days before being moved to the alms house on Blackwell's Island. Now ironically, this was where the founders of the orphanage initially wanted to keep the black children almost 30 years prior when they built the orphanage. The riots lasted for nearly a week. And during that time, the mob ended the lives of black people and their supporters. And they continued to destroy their property. The rioters burned the home of Abby Harper Gibbons a prison reformer and daughter of abolitionist Isaac Hopper. The mob attacked Ann Derrickson and Ann Martin, two white women who were married to black men. The mob attacked a white prostitute, Miss Mary Bird, because she catered to black men. And of course, we all remember the violent attacks at the docks I mentioned earlier. More than 200 black workers were attacked by Irish men at the docks. The white people, they took advantage of the draft riots, and they did all they could to remove evidence of black and interracial social life near the dock area. The white dock workers, they attacked and destroyed boarding houses, brothels, dance halls, and other establishments that served black people. And they even went as far as to strip the clothing off of white owners of these businesses when they came upon them. The mob attacked black men, women, and children, but they really singled out black men for their harshest treatment. And when the angry white mob came upon William Jones, he was hanged and his remains were burned. When the mob came upon Charles Jackson, he was beaten and nearly drowned. When the mob came upon Jeremiah Robinson, he was beaten to death and his remains were thrown into a river. The mob made a sport of mutilating black men, sometimes even sexually. And poor William Williams his chest was jumped on by the mob. He was plunged with a knife and smashed with stones. And all of this was done while a crowd of men, women, and children watched. No one intervened. And when the mob was done with William, they cheered vengeance on every Negro in New York. Now, George Glass, a white laborer, he pulled Abraham Flanken from his apartment, drug him through the streets, and ended his life by hanging him to a lamppost. And once Franklin's remains were removed from the lamppost, 
a 16-year-old Irish boy by the name of Patrick Butler. He drug Franklin's remains through the streets by his genitals. And some black men, they actually tried to fight back, but they were no match for the large, angry white mob. James Castillo, he tried to defend himself when the mob came upon him. Castillo shot at and ran away from a white attacker. But he was caught by the mob, and six members of the mob stomped, kicked, beat, and stoned him before hanging him from a lamppost. The white mob, they did all they could to eradicate the wrecking class black man from the city. In a white labor union, the Longshoremen's Association, they even patrolled the piers during the riots, insisting that the colored people must and shall be driven to other parts of the industry. But these other parts of the industry they did not accept black men either. I mean, they excluded them as well. I mean, the white mobs, they used the riots to remove blacks from workspaces, neighborhoods, and leisure spaces. However, and ironically, Five Points, the most well-known center of black and interracial social life, it remained quiet and calm during the riots. In some rare instances, some of the white and Irish people protected their black neighbors. When Philip White, a black drugstore owner, was threatened by the white mob, his Irish neighbors drove the mob away. I mean, Philip, he had often extended credit to his neighbors. And when the white mob invaded Hart's Alley, they became trapped at its dead end. And when they did, the black and white residents of the neighborhood, they poured hot corn starch on them and drove them away. Now, many felt that New York City leaders did not respond to the massacre or riots in the proper manner in which they should have. Now, the Democratic governor, Horatio Seymour, he openly opposed the draft law and appeared sympathetic to the riots, but he didn't really do much. And the Republican mayor, George Opdyke, he contacted the War Department and asked them to send in federal troops. But he did not clear, declare martial law in response to the massacres as many felt he should have. And around July the 15th, and a few days after that, more than 4,000 federal troops who had been away in the Battle of Gettysburg, they arrived in New York to restore order. Now, the troops initially, they battled with the rioters in the, the Murray neighborhoods before finally being able to restore order. And by midnight on July the 16th, 1863, the New York City Draft Massacre a.k.a. Riot, had finally come to an end. And when it was all said and done, 119 people were recorded to have lost their lives. But it is estimated that as many as 1,200 lives were possibly lost. Lives that were primarily African American. Now due to poor record keeping and other factors, the world may never know the true number of lives lost and everything that actually occurred during the massacre. I mean, not only were many lives lost, thousands of homes and businesses were destroyed and more than 3,000 black residents were left homeless as well. And the Colored Orphan Asylum, now it was rebuilt, but it was rebuilt in what would later be known as Harlem. Now, it was rebuilt in what would later be known as Harlem because property owners, they were protesting when attempts were made to actually rebuild the orphanage in the same place as it previously was. In 
Now, the black people, after the massacre, they worked hard to rebuild and recover. And the Union League Club and Committee of Merchants for the Relief of Colored People, they provided relief efforts and gave $40,000 to almost 2,500 victims and they assisted them with finding new jobs and homes. And a little under a year later, Republican elites and New York City Blacks, they publicly celebrated their renewed alliance. And in December of 1863, the Union League Club was granted permission by the Secretary of War to raise Black Regiment. Or in other words, black soldiers. Now the Union League Club, they marched over 1,000 black soldiers through the streets of New York to board their ships on the Hudson River. And the black men, they were dressed nicely in their blue uniforms and their white gloves. And they were escorted by the police superintendent, 100 policemen, the Union League itself, their friends, and the band. And this powerful march, it displayed the union of black people with the leaders of the new order being ushered in by the Civil War. Now sadly, in 1860, the U.S. Census recorded 12,414 black New Yorkers. But by 1865, after the massacre, the black population had declined to 9,945, which was the lowest number since 1820. Well, that brings us to the end of today's chat. Tell me what you think about it. Do you think it was fair for the immigrants to come to the black people's home and demand their jobs and oppression? What do you think about the city's response to the massacre? I mean, what do you think about the number of lives actually lost? And how many do you think it really was? But before you answer, remember the census numbers I just mentioned. Well, drop your thoughts in the comments below. Please like the video. Please share the video. Please subscribe if you haven't already. And until next time, peace, love, and blessings.